Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Uh, we are so excited to be with you tonight. We have got a huge show planned. We have a lot to talk about. Um, we are celebrating two things. First of all, just by coincidence, we are broadcasting on uh, John Lennon's birthday, what would have been his 78th birthday. And to celebrate his life, we are going to talk about the John Lennon box set, the Imagine box set. There is a lot to go through. Uh, we are going to take you on a walk through that. Um, secondly, um, of course, since we last were on, uh, we had a tremendous loss in the Beatles community, Jeff Emmerich. And so uh, we are devoting part of this show to celebrating his life and legacy. We're going to talk about you know, how he contributed to the Beatles sound and, and what his legacy will be. We want you guys to get involved, so please uh, comment, ask questions. We probably won't be able to get to every one of them during the broadcast, but we will do our best. So, uh, So without further ado, Let's get the show started, but uh, before I do, I'm going to introduce myself and my, my good friends that uh, I have the privilege of hosting this show with. My name is Kid O'Toole. I am the author of Songs We Were Singing, Guided Tours Through the Beatles' Lesser Known Tracks, as well as Michael Jackson FAQ, All That's Left to Know About the King of Pop. I'm the contributing editor for uh, Beatle Fan Magazine. I'm also the author of the Deep Beatles column at Something Else Reviews. And finally, the host of a monthly show on Bumps Radio England called Bottomless Soul. So I'm, I'm kind of, you can't, you can't avoid me. So <laughs> uh, tonight, Ken Womack is not going to be with us. Um, he had something come up at the last minute, but he will be back for the next show. So I am going to introduce my two colleagues tonight. First one, you know him very well. He is the longtime host of the show, Every Little Thing. Uh, he is, uh, which is a great show. It's centered around themes. He interviews people. It's terrific. And he is the host of, or co-host, I should say, of the podcast, Things We Said Today, which uh, is co-hosts uh, with uh, Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo. Uh, it's a great show, and it's a privilege to be with someone who's been in broadcasting for over 36 years, I believe. So I want to welcome, warmly welcome to the program, my friend, Ken Michaels. Hey, Kit. Hey, Ken. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Great to okay. be back, and hi to all of our viewers. Well, thank you very much. It is always awesome to be with you and uh, and and do this show. So the next, there we go. I'm sorry, folks. I was getting rid of that title slide there. It's gone. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're live. The uh, And then my other uh, co-host that I am thrilled to uh, host this show with, he is the co-host of the Paul McCartney podcast, Two Legs, uh, a, uh, as I said, Paul McCartney-centric, along with David Gargolino. And he's doing a special crossover episode with another podcast, When They Was Fab. And he'll tell you about that later on in the show, I'm sure. And so I am pleased to introduce my very good friend, Tom Hanyadi. Hello, Tom. Hello, kid. Hello, Ken. And hello, everybody watching. I mean, I think I'm going to have to write a book or something. I got to get those intros a little longer, you know. I mean, you guys have got so... Uh... <laughs> well, what can I say? You guys have a lot of, of uh, credentials. <laughs> it takes a while. <laughs> I'm kidding. I teased. I, teased. I know. I know. But well, anyways, it's, it's good it... to be here again. Absolutely. It is great to be here. And boy, do we have a packed show tonight. Um, and as I mentioned in the introduction, um, please feel free to leave comments. You know, we may not get to all of them on the air, but uh, we will try to get to some. And we always check them after the broadcast, uh, whether you leave them on our Facebook page or on YouTube. So, uh, you know, please, uh, please feel free to do that. We love hearing from you. So, before we get to the two main topics for tonight, um, we will uh, let's look at some of the news that's been happening. And boy, Ken, there there's been a lot going on recently, hasn't there? 
you could make this all a new show. You really could, <laughs> <laughs> especially the last few months of this year with all the releases and all. But um, a few things I wanted to mention. First of all, Paul McCartney headlined Austin City Limits this past weekend, and his performance with his band was actually streamed. And it was on YouTube and also on Red Bull. And um, I just shared it, as a matter of fact, on Facebook. And I've only seen part of it, but it looked pretty good. And Paul's voice was in great shape. This was towards the end of the show when he was doing Sgt. Pepper and Helter Skelter and Golden Slumbers, the medley. Um, I thought he sounded fantastic with the band. I'm going to be watching the whole thing very soon. And I'll probably just put that link up on our own talk more talk page on facebook so everybody else can watch it did you guys get the good idea part of it no i didn't uh i tried to watch the, the stream i think it was the red bull stream uh the other day and of course i missed it just as it ended so uh but yeah i'm going to watch the whole thing thank you so much uh, ken for posting that whole concert because yeah. i have been hearing great things about it okay and of course he's going to be headlining again this coming weekend as well and by the way, it wasn't a complete concert because it was a slightly shorter set list finished off at right. 31 songs. That includes the medley as three songs, just a little bit shorter. Um, also, last week, uh, Paul announced that he's writing a new children's book called Hey, Grand Dude. And uh, it was inspired by his grandchildren. He said, I have eight grandchildren and they're all beautiful. And one day one of them said, hey, grand dude. And I said, what? But I kind of like that. So from now on, he's been called Grand Dude. And he wanted to write this for grandfathers everywhere. So this book is going to be coming out next September. But from what I've been told, you can already pre-order it a year in advance <laughs> <laughs> online. Um, also, we know about Paul being interviewed on 60 Minutes. Did you guys get to see that at all? Yes. Sure uh, your impressions. Um, well, uh, I thought it was it was it was not bad. Um, you know, the whole part where with with the John comp complimenting him on only one song, you know, kind of left me a little unfulfilled. But um, because we all know, that I think that John probably paid Paul the biggest compliment of all time with coming out of retirement, thanks to coming up. You know, so I mean, that was a big influence for him coming out of retirement. So. Um, but I mean, it wasn't bad. I, I kind of get a little chill. I get a little emotional whenever I hear somebody talk about my favorite artist of all time. So it, it was nice, but it wasn't very informative the way I was hoping. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought too. Um, you know, the questions were kind of the same questions we've heard over and over with the exception of that, that part about John only complimenting him once and, and, uh, uh it, yeah, I, I didn't feel it really covered any new ground except, I really love the part when um, the interviewer, whose name I'm blanking out on right now, but she showed him um, that a clip from the Let It Be rooftop concert where where right. he and John were smiling at each other, mm -hmm. and the look on Paul's face, you know, right. like it was. I mean, you could tell he was kind of thinking back to that, and he, he got this little smile. But you could tell, like, he didn't want to show too much. I think it was kind of a private moment, and he he didn't want to. Uh, you know, get too emotional or anything, but that part, I, you know, and I thought, gosh, I wish more of the interview could have been like that. You know, that was, mm. that was such a beautiful moment. Actually, I was a little bit impressed by this interview because while it was geared towards a general audience, yeah. there were some things there that Paul said that weren't shocking, but he doesn't say all that often about um, him wanting to be liked still, that John was very insecure um, in fact, there was the one time when John said to him, and he said this before in other interviews, do you think that I'll be remembered well, you know, and, and Paul said, hey, you know, are you kidding? Of course you're going to be remembered well. But um, there was one moment there where they were looking at one of the last photos taken of the Beatles, taken by Linda, and we've all seen these photos before, and John looked right. a little grumpy in it. And Paul said that's because he was thinking about his tax situation yeah. at the moment, which <laughs> I never heard him say before. I thought that was kind of interesting. But yeah, the here, there, and everywhere quote, I've heard Paul say that before. And you can understand John was not the type of person to give compliments all that often. Yeah, we just uh, got a, a viewer, Mean Mr. Mayo. Uh, hello there. <laughs> hello. We, we 
know you. And um, he said, yeah, John himself made it clear he was insecure. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's safe to say. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, Paul's making a new video for Who Cares? Um, and it hasn't been shown yet, but Emma Stone will be in it. So he's now made several videos already for songs from Egypt Station. Um, also, Ringo will be performing at Vets Aid. This is a charity that was started by Joe Walsh recently to help families uh, with war veterans. And uh, Ringo will be performing November 11th in Tacoma, Washington. On the same bill with Joe, Don Henley, James Taylor, uh, Chris Stapleton, and Haim. As far as I know, it's probably just Ringo, not with the All-Stars. But, um, you know, nice to see that Ringo's helping out there. And uh, there was Ringo's interview on uh, Dan Rather's The Big Interview Show, which is on AXS. I've only seen excerpts of it so far. I'm hoping to see the whole thing soon. But did either of you get to see any part of that? I did not, yeah. but uh, we were talking before the show. Tom did. <laughs> and what do you think? <laughs> and yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't terrible. Um, however, you know, again, I mean, I, I think you, the, you know, get this into this trap where, you know, he's most of it, most of the interview is, is all, is all Beatle talk. And, hmm. you know, again, that gets, that gets kind of frustrating as well because he's, he's also had this long 48, you know, year career of a solo artist. So, you know, what's, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, and he does, but it, it's nowhere near the amount of time that he spends uh, talking about um, life as a Beatle. Right. That's just the way it is with most interviews with Paul and Ringo. It's right. geared towards a mainstream audience. But right. I did see some excerpts, and I like the fact that Dan Rather brought up Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, and it was kind yeah. of daring. It was daring for Ringo to leave Rory Storm because they were, at one point, the biggest band in Liverpool to go and leave them for the Beatles, and Ringo said that they really became friends in Hamburg, and Ringo right. said he loved, loved the front line of John, Paul, and George. Sure. Right. That's what made him want to join the Beatles. But um, yeah, it, it, I have to see the whole thing in order to comment about it. But the few excerpts right. that I saw were OK. They're OK. Yeah. But again, remember who the audience is for these shows. Right. So that's about all the news that I have at the moment. So all right. oh, can I add one thing? Can I oh, add sure. one thing? Uh, uh, today we just got the list for record store day, and um, Paul McCartney, the the um, come on to me, and I don't know, uh, forty five uh, will you know seven inch will get released on that day. So looking forward oh, to that. Oh, that's right. You mentioned that on our page. Yep, that's right. Yeah, that uh, that'll be interesting. Oh, and there's one more thing that uh, we we have to mention um, that we have a a big announcement about our own show. Um, we Wait. are going to have a panel. Uh, at the White Album Conference uh, at Monmouth University that's coming up next month. We are really excited about it, our first live show, yay. And, uh, <laughs> and, it's, uh, and, and we've got a great topic planned. Um, it's going to be, um, the conference itself is November 8th through the 11th. We will be uh, doing our uh, presentation, uh, or panel rather, uh, November 11th on Sunday at 10.30 in the morning and we are going to talk about how the white album foreshadows the solo careers i think it's going to be a really great panel you do not want to miss it so um so do check that out so uh, i guess okay i think that is really all the news now <laughs> there's so much going on now it's it's just really been a crazy you know busy couple of months you know with all this stuff coming out yeah. um yep. yeah yeah and thankfully, it's not letting up. <laughs> yep, that's right. I mean, hey, I'm not complaining. Bring it on. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, before very we very expensive to our, year. Yes, it is. It is a very it's expensive time to be a fan. Well, um, right. Like, well, I think uh, before we get to our main topics, we we do have to show now. Those of you who are are uh, listening to this on Fab Four Radio will not get the full effect of this, but we all need to show we're wearing particular T-shirts tonight to uh, <laughs> to celebrate John. So, yep. So we've got you may say I'm a dreamer from uh, from Ken Michaels. The lyrics there. We've got a oh John New York City T-shirt. And I've got kind of a bootleg, um, <laughs> Sergeant Pepper. I'm telling. Sergeant, it, it, it's, it's actually, 
it's actually the T-shirt from uh, from the Beetle Fest last year that was a takeoff on the Sgt. Pepper cover. So, so not oh. really like so don't don't arrest me so anyway <laughs> but uh but yeah we are we are wearing our our shirts um to honor two people that we are going to talk about tonight and let's talk about jeff emmerich um i think it's safe to say uh this was pretty shocking news um i'm sure i don't have to really inter you know describe him for all of you you all know he was the recording engineer primarily for uh revolver through abbey road with some exceptions there which uh, long to get into um but uh you know and and really um a, a, a you know pretty pretty big player in the beatles story to say the least so before we get into talking about his career i just want to get uh, both of you your uh and and again those of you who are watching feel free to to weigh in here um what was your initial reaction when when you heard the news um ken what uh you know what was your initial thought he's totally shocked mm -hmm. i mean no one could see this coming and when you consider the fact that jeff most recently had been very busy he'd been putting together these um workshops where he was explaining the whole recording process with the mixing board and he was, you know, about to do select uh, shows in different areas. So we had all that planned. He was recently at the Fest for Beatle fans in Chicago. Um, he appeared there with Jack Douglas. Um, I just read on Facebook that our friend Vivek Tiwari, who wrote uh, The Fifth Beatle, the graphic novel, which is now going to be made into a like a mini series on television. Vivek had been talking to Jeff Emmerich about working on the music for that. So right. he had he had plans. To, you know, he wasn't resting easy <laughs> um, and he was getting more involved with social media. You know, uh, he had his own Facebook page recently, always posting stuff. So, you know, he was living life to the fullest. So uh, I was really surprised to hear this news. Yeah. Tom, what about you? Well, you know, me and Mr. Mayo beat me to it, but I was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, not to do a Ruddles bit, but yeah, I mean, I was shocked and stunned. Uh, you know, earlier this year in January, he had announced that he was going to come to Tucson. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out then because they couldn't find a, um, uh, you know, a, a place big enough to hold at least 5,000 people. And I was trying to help out with that. But um, when they did find something, it, it, it didn't come soon enough. So unfortunately, then, they, then it got postponed. And then about late August, I heard again that he was going to come back to Tucson um in september so obviously i i mean i first thought was okay how do i get out of work to, just, to do this you know and and, and sure. get down there because it's only really an hour hour and a half drive so it was it was exciting uh looking forward to it i was planning on getting out of work and then driving down there and then unfortunately you know we find out that he passes um Ironically, I mean, this is kind of almost like the second time this has happened to me. When I moved out here, moved to Arizona um, back in 2010, Ravi Shankar was coming out here, and we, my wife and I had bought tickets to go see him. So on the day that he was supposed to perform, he canceled the show because he got sick. And what happened? Not too much longer, he, not much, too much later, he, he passed. So oh, wow. <laughs> um, not having too much wow. luck here on, on, uh, on this. But anyways, um, absolutely. The guy, you know, was his career was very impressive. We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But, um, you know, it, it's definitely that circle is, is definitely getting smaller. And um, let's, let's, let's keep it that size for a few more years. Let's not make it any smaller anytime soon, you know, so it's. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And, and I, uh, I did see him in August uh, at the, uh, the Fest for Beatles fans and, and had the privilege of meeting him uh, very briefly, but, uh, but I did and got to give him my book, which I'm, boy, am I glad I did that, um, <laughs> and got to tell him you know, uh, how, how I admired him. And, and uh, he gave a talk 
uh, that was very interesting. Um, you know, he definitely had feelings about the, you know, the Sergeant Pepper box set from last year, the remasters. Mm -hmm. uh, he made that clear. Uh, you yep. know, didn't didn't love all the the you know changing the remastering and so forth, the remixing, I should say that uh, right. that Giles did and and all. I mean, he, that that was pretty clear. But I mean, you know, overall he seemed in in decent shape. Um, you know, for for someone his age, um, and uh, seemed to enjoy meeting everybody. And uh, and I'll tell you, it, it was a moment. I'm sure you guys found this too where you know today with the way things unfold on social media it's like you're watching the news unfold in real time i mean it was all of a sudden at about nine o'clock that night you know all these you know i i started hearing the pinging of my facebook messenger and right. all like what's going on and and then i saw all these you know uh statements from my i think ken i think you may have posted one i know darren did uh steve Marinucci, um mm. i mean a bunch of people and were like this is unconfirmed oh uh, fab four free for all i think they did they were like this is unconfirmed this is unconfirmed and then of course the sad news uh came across it, it was really shocking i mean just considering I'd seen him in August and, and that he right. seemed basically okay. Um, and, right. uh, and of course he was supposed to be one of the speakers at uh, Ken Womack's uh, conference next month, which uh, made it doubly sad. I know a lot of people were looking forward to meeting him there. Yeah. So, uh, I was so hoping, yeah, uh, that he would be able to sign this for me, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, yep. I yeah. know it's, it's, it's really, it, it's, it's really a, a sad thing. And so, um, that now that you, that was a nice nice segue you, you gave me Tom because I was just going to ask and because because obviously uh, Jeff talked about this quite a bit in in his autobiography here there and everywhere if if you guys watching or listening haven't read it you should um, what do you think he contributed to the Beatles what did what did he bring to the Beatles music. Uh, Ken, what uh, you know, just sort of in general, what do you what do you think he added to them? Well, because the Beatles were always evolving and growing at such a rapid pace, um, he came along at the right time. Even though he started around the time when he witnessed "Love Me Do" being recorded, but he didn't become the principal engineer until "Revolver." And when you think about the fact that the first song he worked on was Tomorrow Never Knows, I mean, what a challenge that must have been. But um, he proved to be the perfect guy to be the engineer for the Beatles. And, um, you know, it, it's taken me all these years to realize that the whole Beatles story itself is like perfect poetry. How certain people like Brian Epstein came along at the right time. Uh, where would they have been if George Martin hadn't been their producer? And in the early years, Norman Smith was the, the main producer on their records, and Jeff complimented him a lot and learned a lot from Norman. And he made a lot, he made those early records special, but Norman Smith then left and he went on to produce acts like Pink Floyd. So just at that moment, that's when the Beatles were doing, we're gonna do Revolver. Imagine if Norman hadn't left what would the Beatles music have sounded like with such adventurous, groundbreaking music and songs if it had been a different engineer? Um, and so there's so many things that Jeff brought to the music, but he, he had talked in many of his interviews about how limiting it was at EMI with the equipment that they had because they were primarily known for recording classical music. They didn't care as much about pop and rock, even though pop and rock is what paid the bills there, and they made more money from <laughs> Beatles records and classical music. But he had to find ways with the equipment that they had to make it work for all the Beatles' demands. They always wanted to keep getting new sounds. And so I would say, and you can't just sum it up in one sound bite, right. but I mean, the close miking techniques that he brought to the Beatles recordings. In particular, when, when they did Revolver, he close mic the, the string section on Eleanor Rigby. He close mic the Indian instruments on Love You Too. He close mic the horns on Got To Get You Into My Life. And then Tomorrow Never Knows Itself is a book in waiting. Just, you know, yeah. all the adventurousness that was that was put into that song alone and, and everything that's been said about John's voice going through a Leslie Speaker for the last verse of that, because he wanted it to sound like he was on top of a mountain, like the Dalai Lama, all of that. 
but he was always looking for different ways of getting different sounds on Beatle records. And it wasn't just the close miking, it was also where he placed the microphones. Because there's a lot that's been said, and he deserves so much credit about, um, well, close miking the drums in particular, he was told that right. you couldn't put a, a microphone in front of the bass drum right. unless it was 16 inches away, and he wanted to make it four inches. And then right. there'd be times that he would place the microphone inside the drum kit, like the toms, on a day in the life, and removing the the, the bottom skin, and it had more of a you know a thud to it, you know, and and um, just trying to invent ways of coming up with different sounds for four people who wanted to keep growing and and were very demanding in the studio. A lot of that came from Jeff. You also got to admit that he was afforded this because he was working for the biggest band in the world. But um, because EMI was just so strict with what they allowed in the studio. But if it wasn't for the fact that this is the Beatles we're talking about, he was allowed to get away with some of this stuff. But still, he deserves all the credit for coming up with these ideas. And so you can pinpoint certain songs. Mr. Kite, Strawberry Fields Forever. We can go into those songs in detail if you want. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a nutshell, I think so much of what he did revolved around getting specific sounds that they needed. And a lot of that was from what he did with the microphones. And there's other things too, but I'll let you guys talk. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tom, uh, Tom, what do you think? Well, you know, Ken, you're absolutely right. I mean, he was there, right place, right time. I mean, right at the perfect age as well. I mean, coming in at 15, 16 years old, Oh. Can you not hear me? Oh, okay. We can we can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yep. Now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Take all right. two. Very good. Well, <laughs> well, anyways. All right. <laughs> Matter of fact, he, uh, George uh, Jeff Emmerich was heard on Revolution Number One saying "Take two. Anyways. <laughs> um, hey, that's yes. that's a good tie-in. I didn't even think of right. that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyways, yes, Ken, you're right. I mean, coming in at the right age. I mean, at the right place at the right time the right age 15 16 years old you're soaking up all of that knowledge from from normal as they used to call them um, from George Martin and you're also growing with the band I mean I he's look at about all of the stuff that he's witnessing at the same time they're they're out there busting their butts taking risk and that's that had to have been influ influential on him to to want to you know to do this as a, as a young engineer in training and then plus the training that he had before he came, he became the uh, the engineer. Where he's, where he, he's he's cutting Motown records. So he's you know getting hearing these sounds that you know EMI wasn't allowed to do. So he's getting all of this other knowledge coming from other, you know, other uh, countries and whatnot. And then he's going to be able to present that to to Beatles when it's mm. his time. Is look, I'm I'm ready for this. I mean, and even though he he says, you know, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, I wasn't really ready, but in in a way he was because at the same time he was growing and he was progressing with them right around the same, you know, at, at the same time. So, I mean, it was like almost a, a match made in heaven, really. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I think, you know, one of the other things that strikes me about him is, you know, his his willingness to sort of try anything, you know, his his right. willingness mm -hmm. to take risks. I mean, you know, reading the story, I mean, it's funny, but it's but it's kind of, you know, res just illustrates what I'm talking about, the whole thing about when John said how he wanted his voice to sound different and, you know, First of all, he said, you know, swinging, you know, just suspend me from the ceiling right. and swing mm -hmm. me around the microphone. Well, that didn't work. But the fact that Jeff Emmerich at one point actually said, sure, let's put a microphone in a condom and put it in the water and see if <laughs> that would change anything. I mean, who would do that? I mean, I, I just think, you know, he, he really was willing to try these crazy ideas that could have gotten him into a lot of trouble. He mentioned that, as I recall, a few right. times in his autobiography that he's like, I could have gotten fired for the rewiring he did and and all but yep. it paid off and mm -hmm. you know would would they have achieved you know would the Beatles have mm -hmm. achieved the same you know really experimental 
kind of uh, sounds that they used on Tomorrow Never Knows. Um, uh, you know, and, and take your pick on Sergeant Pepper. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even some things like you know, Long 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 or something on Magic. On um, excuse me, uh, parts of the, the White Album, or the, I'm thinking of another um, uh, Blue Jay Way. I think that's what I'm thinking of. Excuse me, Blue Jay Way. Um, you know, some of the sounds on that. I mean, it's it's really. Uh, you know, I don't know if other engineers would have taken those kind of risks and therefore would the Beatles have, have really sounded as, as futuristic as they did and, and really were, right. became trendsetters, you know? And, mm. um, and I think as you both said absolutely correctly that, that he, you know, was the right person at the right time. And, and actually that leads me to another question I, I wanted to throw out to you guys, which was, what was his working relationship like with George Martin? I, I wanted to just read you. I pulled out a few quotes from, from Ken's uh, book. This is volume two of, of his two-volume um, uh, biography of George Martin. Uh, this one, I'm, I'm just going to read a few things here. is from Sound Pictures. Um, and one of the quotes says, the Beatles understood that it was Martin and Emmerich who were the ones who were prying open the locks and recasting them for a new musical age. Um, another uh, quote, and this is a bit more of a direct description of their their working relationship, as, as Ken mentioned it. Um, Martin was a master of orchestration and had a natural gift for shaping the uh, the work of um, the, his artists, but he lacked the vast storehouse of knowledge in terms of engineering and the nuts and bolts of record production that his younger colleague had in spades. So, what uh, what you know? Do you guys think? What do you think? There? How did they complement each other? How did they work with each other? Do you think? I think what Ken said there really kind of sums up quite a lot because George Martin was a master at not only orchestration, but arrangements of songs. If you know, uh, especially in the early years, his suggestions on what to do with certain songs like speeding up, please, please me, or uh, placing the chorus of a song at the beginning, like she loves you and can't buy me love. You know, he came up with so many great ideas and also, you know, he played the keyboards on a lot of, of Beatles songs too. But um, Jeff Emmerich was probably much more technical and had more of a mind for that. If you listen or watch any of the interviews with Jeff online, and thankfully, if you go on YouTube, you'll find quite a lot there. You can just tell, you know, he has the mind for all this technical stuff. And sometimes for people who aren't that technical who are watching, it's kind of over your head. But um, yeah, I think that the two of them complemented each other. Jeff knew how to get certain sounds, and if he didn't know, he'd experiment until he got what he wanted. And um, and just the mere fact that even after the Beatles, George Martin and Jeff Emmerich continued to work together. Sometimes I like to say, where there's George Martin, there's Jeff Emmerich. And that kind of tells you something about that relationship. You know, whether it's sometimes with Paul McCartney or uh, America, a band like that, they work together. You know, it just showed, shows you how they continue to have that mutual respect for each other. Mm-hmm. Tom, what do you think? Is there was a- well, you know, obviously my my is just going to piss me off for the rest of the night here. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's oh. level two. Both of them, are you there again? Oh, okay, yeah. I think. I think, yep, we're here now. Yep. All right. Well, anyways, I, you know, what I'm saying is it just wasn't on a business level either. It was on a personal level as well. I mean, Jeff Emmerich has, 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 has gone on saying that, you know, their, their kind of sense of humor was the same too. And I, I would imagine that, that you would have to get along on a personal level well, just not on a, on a working level. So, I, I, you know, the fact that they got along on a personal level, you know, says a lot too. You know, especially like you said, Ken, I mean, we're all of those years that they've worked together, you know, it's got to be more than just, you know, business. It's got to be, you know, at least a mm-hmm. little bit of a, you know, a joke here, a joke there. And he would say that George Martin would be laughing on the inside and he would still keep his composure. But <laughs> in reality, he's cracking mm-hmm. up. So, um, so for that matter, I mean, they definitely, you know, had a great working relationship, I think. So, 
And and I mentioned I, I wrote a um, tribute uh, to uh, to Jeff last week, and one of the things I mentioned was that you know how many people and 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 um, George Martin was part of this, obviously. Uh, you know, John would say John Lennon would say something like, you know, I want to sound like the Dalai Lama chanting from the mountaintop. I want right. to smell the sawdust on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, he would make those statements, and then. George Martin, you know, would would think, oh, that you know, you you want this kind of sound, you know, you want a, a kind of carnivalesque kind of sound, you want this kind of thing, and then would talk to Jeff, and Jeff, you know, would be like, I think I know how we can do that, you know, here here I think he could kind of execute it by wiring the equipment and everything, and so it was, you know, it was kind of a, I I think the two of them had a real collaborative you know, relationship. They, I think they complemented each other very well. And as, as Ken mentioned in his book, I think he, you know, they, they compensated for each other. I mean, you know, I, I think um, Jeff mentioned in both Ken Womack's book and also probably in Here, There and Everywhere that, you know, I don't know anything about arrangements and, and, you know, that kind of thing, but <laughs> I do know how <laughs> to record them in, in a way that will sound different, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, and, uh, and Ken, I, I, you mentioned something I, I did want to touch on too, that, that not only did Jeff, you know, work with the Beatles, obviously, but he worked mm -hmm. with Paul and Ringo as, as solo artists, um, in fact, won a Grammy for the work he did on Band on the Run, and so, right. uh, so, of course, since we're, we're all about the solo Beatles. What what do you think? What did he bring to their albums? You know something? Um, I was hoping to see Jeff at this symposium coming up because I interviewed Jeff back in 2006 when his book came out. And it was all about the Beatles. I had very limited time to, to talk to him. The one thing I always wanted to talk about the most is the solo music because you rarely ever hear Paul McCartney talk about um, Jeff Emmerich specifically for what he brought to his solo music or a Jeff Emmerich for that for that matter but all that I can say is that Jeff Emmerich played a part in a lot of McCartney albums and that alone is a statement um, it's not just Band on the Run there was London Town Tug of War, Pipes of Peace, Give My Regards to Broad Street, like I said, where there's George Martin, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's Jeff Emmerich, but sure. he also uh, worked on the song Put It There um, from Flowers in the Dirt. In fact, he's in the video for the song Put It There with George Martin as well. Um, he went on to work on Unplugged. He worked, oh, well, he's, he's, I think he's on just about every song on Flaming Pie. Um, he was involved mm -hmm. a little bit with Memory Almost Full um good evening new york city so you're talking about decades of working with paul mccartney um he also engineered we all stand together all right <laughs> <laughs> again it's it's one of those songs with great orchestration from george martin and there's jeff emmerich engineering it um so just the fact that he worked for so many years and kept that relationship with paul and um and also it should be pointed out, he was the engineer on Free as a Bird in Real Love. So not only did you have right. Jeff Lynne doing the production on it, you had someone from the old regime working on it too. So, um, you know, that alone is a statement. And as you said, with Ringo, he did uh, the mixing on Vertical Man. But I also read uh, Jeff had said that he had worked on Sentimental Journey which of oh, course George Martin that. produced, but you know, you didn't see his right. name in the credits. At least no. I haven't seen it anywhere. Yeah, that's well, a recall, yeah. But Jeff did say that. Mm. So yeah, okay. that's true. He also said that he, he was asked to work on some plastic auto band tracks, but I haven't seen his name there, you know? Mm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Wow, okay. And and so uh, Tom, you are the, the Paul McCartney podcast host extraordinaire. <laughs> <laughs> so well, it looks you are well, the look i mean oh no just my, say you my, are you the know, paul opinion, expert what do you think he contributed right. to paul's no, album don't say i don't please <laughs> <laughs> anyways listen honestly my, you know 
Jeff has gone on to say that, you know, Paul's his guy. He's the musician's musician. That being said, I personally don't think that that Paul maybe challenged Jeff enough to be as innovative as maybe he was during the beat because Paul pretty much always knew what he wanted. So they had a really close working relationship during the Beatles. And I think maybe that's why they got along. So maybe that's why he wanted Jeff to come in with, with him on, on these, um, these solo albums. And, you know, that was his work on Mole of Kintyre. He was there, um, you know, recording, you know, the bagpipe, um, you know, when they were there out recording outside. I mean, there was challenges that they had, you know, recording outside. I was reading that, you know, you know, they had to put a sock over the microphone so they wouldn't get that wind uh, sound, you know, as uh, as they're recording the, uh, you know, the, the song. And then plus they're in a barn recording the bagpipe. And it's as it's getting dark they're noticing the real getting really dark and they find out it's the light from all you know, there's hundreds and thousands of moss all over the place and it's moss exploding from the light and getting all over the real <laughs> so they had to <laughs> you know carefully you know wipe off the tape or you know off you know, and but you know it's, it's you know and then and uh, Oh, time you're going out again. That's, I don't know. Okay, can you hear me right, now? How about take three? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're back. You're back. Yes. All right. And then plus, you know, the work on Band on the Run where he obviously he won his third Grammy, you know, so you you have to look at that. You got to look at, you know, he he contributed on Picasso's, um, you know, Drink to Me where you got that, you know, that middle section where they wanted it you know, to, to kind of be like a Picasso abstract painting where you get all these different sounds and, mm. you know, and it, and it's added here and there, you know, in a, in a different way. So, so I give them credit that, even though that's not one of my, you know, songs that I generally go to, but I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta appreciate, you know, the work that he did on there. And then plus, yeah, like London town, you know, I love the sound, you know, I love the folky sound that, you know, for, you know, half of the album on that and, and, you know, Flaming Pie, the, um, the Vertical Man, you know, yeah, I was reading that, you know, he did the mixing on that. He does in the credits to say that he does do some additional engineering on there. So he does, you know, he had to have, you know, had a say in, you know, in a, in a track. I love the, the drumming sound that you get on Vertical Man, you know, and, and again, yeah. you know, throughout the Beatles time, I mean, his work, you know, with the Beatles and getting that drumming sound. I mean, um, songs like La Di Da, I love the drumming on that. What in the mm. world is has great, you know, great drumming on it. And I got to take that's that's part of his, you know, part of his work. You know, yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, like I was walking, and all, I mean that. Yeah, that is yeah, really yeah. powerful, like hard hitting drums. I mean, you hear it on on that yeah. recording. And and Tom, I really like mm -hmm. your your what you said about how he would create. I mean, almost like a painting. Um, you know how right. he would use you know, but paint with sound. in, in this sound, case, exactly. And and I really right. I like that image. I think that that is what yeah. what he was kind of doing you know and and helping the beatles do that i mean obviously the beatles and george martin in their their time and then paul mccartney i mean you know they they can take some credit for that as well but uh <laughs> but i think you know just to clarify but i think that um you know jeff was was a big part of that i just want to show this quick comment here that our friend beetle ed from fab four radio hello there um he mentioned that another book to look at to really uh you know, to, to really get into this um, stuff is uh, recording the Beatles, and that's very true. That's a that's yeah. an excellent book, uh, Jerry Hammock, I think that is, and and yes. Uh, yes, and so I I agree. Thank you very much for pointing that out. So along right. with Jeff Emmerich's book, do check that one out if you want to read more details. Uh, well, we're about to come to the end of this segment, so I I wanted to just sort of end this by by having us talk about what is what do you think his legacy is not just with the beatles but but with recording in in general what do you think his you know his ultimate legacy will be tom what what do you uh, what do you think you know his his innovativeness um you know his the philosophy like the beatles had it's about the song what is going to help the song and 
I really appreciate that. He takes the time to listen to the song, you know, put the headphones on, close your eyes, listen to it, and then see what you can add to the picture. And then plus listen to the artist, you know, if, you know, obviously he's the kind of person that you can say, well, this can work, you know, and then plus, you know, he really didn't have an option because they said there's, there's really no such thing as no or can't in the Beatles camp, you know? So, um, <laughs> You know, he had to figure this stuff out. And then, and because of that, you know, there's engineers out there that, you know, probably wouldn't know how to do certain things if it wasn't for him. So definitely innovator. And then plus, you know, his fourth Grammy Awards for tech was a technical Grammy Awards. Yeah, I, I know it was banned on the run. Did he do for Sgt. Pepper too? Yes. For that? I thought I so, yeah. I believe Abbey Road. Yeah. yeah, and that's right, Abbey Road, yeah. 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 Sergeant Pepper, Abbey Road, Band on the Run, and then the the technical uh, Grammy. So yeah, he's a four time winner, and you know it, it's well deserved. He will not be, or he will be missed. His his music, his his legacy will live on for a long time. Ken, what do you uh, anything to? I would pretty much echo those words. Yeah. I think that um, it's he, he. Tom just said something I was going to bring up about how the Beatles. They, they would not accept the word no. You just kept on trying to get the sound that they wanted until it was achieved. And Jeff was very fortunate to be working for them because they were the biggest band. But um, also, another thing to mention is that uh, right at that time of Revolver is when the Beatles stopped touring. So they had a lot more time to spend in the studio. They weren't going to go perform live. And so they can concentrate on, you know, mastering this craft even more than they had already of making these records. And just the mere fact that he would try anything, he would probably hear in his own head or figure <coughs> out what would work. But if it didn't work, he'd try something else until they got the sound that they achieved. And, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to understand if you don't have a technical mind. It's more easier to think, what would this music sound like had anybody else engineered it? And then you'd hear the difference. He just happened to be the right guy at the right time. And he really delivered the goods. And, you know, so much is said. I, I'm always a song man first because I'll, I'll probably say this a million times on this show. But to me... The song is the most important thing. The production is secondary. But if the production can enhance a great song, it can only make it better. And right. the Beatles engineers, all of them, really did that. And I'm kind of fortunate. I, I, I'm, I feel like, you know, certainly during the Beatles years, you never heard about the engineers at all. You heard about George Martin. No. Right. And I think thankfully right. through someone like Mark Lewison, you saw these names that you might not have seen before. And so we're starting to hear these names like Jeff Emmerich more and more and Norman Smith and Ken Scott and Phil McDonald, who actually worked with all four solo Beatles, too. So these right. people all deserve some credit. Jeff Emmerich had happened to be there during a time that was so extremely creative. Some people might think it was a creative peak. That's always subject for another debate. But, um, you know, he was the right guy at the right time. And uh, he came up with great sounds on those records, which is part of the reason why we love them so much. I, right. I really, if, yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tom. No, I didn't just add. I mean, I don't think it was until Abbey Road until that's what exactly I think when he got his first credit on a on a Beatles record on the back it says special thanks to to Jeff Emmerich so you know you didn't see those names like you said Ken I mean it's it wasn't I mean it was the producer and that was pretty much it hmm. yeah. I think wasn't Phil McDonald mentioned on the back cover of Abbey Road I yeah think. yeah but it, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was as well it was it was Je it was you know Jeff Emmerich and Phil McDonald but the point is is I mean it wasn't until Abbey Road until you actually saw those names other than mm. um George Martin you know the behind the scene names anyways right yeah, yeah and yeah. I I think that's a good point uh, uh too well both of you were making but Ken that you mentioned about thanks to people like Mark Lewis and um you know we really got to learn who these people were and mm -hmm. and their importance to the Beatles story, you know, their artistic development. And, and uh, you know, I, I will just, uh, you know, echo what you both said. I, I think he, you know, really pioneered so many, you know, so many techniques that today, let's face it, you could probably, you know, pr probably today's producers, producers would say, oh, Pro Tools, we could do that, no problem. Mm, but right. think back, 
to when Jeff was doing them. I mean, it was the old fashioned way. Right, um, right. And, you know, of cutting up tape and, and, you know, I mean, it was, uh, it was the, the, hard way to do it uh but again he was fearless and and was right. willing to try new things and and i think that too will be be his legacy is is to um constantly you know expand what sound can be and and how it can create help create the mood of a song you know i mean i think he really you know expanded that for for future engineers artists and and everybody so he he will truly be missed um and as as you said at the beginning tom you know the beatles circle is getting smaller and smaller and it's it's really sad i mean it's inevitable but uh you know, it's it's the truth, and so we we will miss him, and uh, and we will at least when we listen to the Beatles recordings, Paul's recordings, Ringo stuff, and and America, and so on and so forth. We will always hear Jeff in those sounds. Yeah, so, yeah. I'd also just like to add that, um, that Ringo posted a tribute to Jeff. Yes, and yes. And, and, and Paul actually posted two tributes. Two. Yes, mm -hmm. the second one, which is on his website is very very it's just wonderful and heartfelt yeah. and you should really take a look at that if you can on paul's website agreed agreed right. all right well we now move on to the second part of our program and as as you all may have guessed this is going to be an extended episode we're going to be going a little bit over uh what we normally would because these are two very important topics and we wanted to spend enough time on them so we are going to move on since this is John Lennon's birthday uh, tonight, we are going to take a look at the set that everybody's talking about, um, the Imagine Ultimate box set. And I think I can say right away, when I say ultimate, I mean ultimate. Um, <laughs> they're not kidding. I mean, it's it's right. an incredible, incredible set. Before we we take you through the the unboxing, which Tom is, yep, he's getting ready to do it, and he's uh, he's going to show you what's what's in there. Just give you an overview. I just wanted to to just before we get into that, talk a little bit about the album itself. You know, uh, imagine. So it's getting this huge tribute through the box set and through the book and through the DVD um, and Blu-ray of both Give Me Some Truth and the Imagine film that can be, which by the way, we will be talking about the book and the DVD in the next episode. We will not have time to discuss that tonight. Um, why is it getting this sort of treatment? Why, why is Imagine so important in John Lennon's canon, catalog, you know, however you want to put it? Hmm. Well, I certainly think it's one of his best albums. Some might even think it is his best album. It came out at a time when he was getting uh, high praise for the Plastic Ono Band album. This was his follow-up, although Plastic Ono Band commercially wasn't the big success that, you know, it deserved to be. It's a very harsh album, you know, to start your career with, something that <laughs> that raw and intimate. And John John would mm -hmm. say that Imagine was plastic auto band with sugar coating on it. And I certainly agree with that. The songs on there are commercial, but at the same time, uh, the lyrics are so strong and powerful. And there there's uh, a mix of different styles on there. Um, of course, the song Imagine has become his most iconic solo song. And um, it really is an amazing song with so many cover versions that have been made of that one. Jealous Guy is looked at as one of his best love songs. Um, and I also think a lot of attention is drawn to Imagine because George Harrison is on, you know, more than half of the album. But um, at the same time, it really is a wonderful album. You know, we can, we're going to debate this in other shows. I happen to think that Plastic Auto Band, Imagine, Mind Games, Walls and Bridges are all great albums. And I, I would hope that Mind Games and Walls and Bridges in particular would get this kind of treatment. I don't know if that will happen, but um, there's so much to explore on Imagine. And the way that it's presented in this box set is just absolutely wonderful. And not only do I, I love the songs on this album, but I just think that the musicians that were on this album helped to make it what it was. They were the perfect players for all these songs. They worked so well with John. They knew the art of complimenting each other. 
not overshadowing each other, much like the Beatles were, you know? And um, I think this album has stood the test of time. I just think every song is wonderful. The one song that I always had a problem with all these years was I Don't Want to Be a Soldier, but I've grown to love that one now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's simply a great album. And I, I think maybe because, you know, Imagine is the title track and it's gone on to be the classic that it is, this album may get more attention than the others. I think the others deserve it, <laughs> the <laughs> attention. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm very glad that it's been given this treatment. Yeah, yeah, and and I'll just just uh, before you answer, Tom, I just wanted to mention. Yeah, our, our friend Beetle had also mentioned the songs and the the song "Imagine" and the subject still work today. Yeah, I I think mm -hmm. that is another reason for uh, its its longevity. I mean, you listen to some of the songs on the album; it's kind of scary how how they play <laughs> today, <laughs> quite frankly. Yeah. So, Tom, what what uh, what do you think? Well, you know. Exactly. Imagine the song itself. It's a timeless message. It's it's a wonderful message. It's it's a message of of hope. I mean, it's it's it can be the song could have been used in any era, in my opinion, and people should respond to the song. I mean, and, and you know, like Ken said, I mean, it's, it's you know, very personal album, just like Plastic Ono Band was, um, but just with more of a little bit of a commercial feel to it. You know, um, the fact that George Harrison is on there, I mean, yes, gave it, you know, all the you know, a lot more attention that he deserves. And, and a certain song about uh, his an ex bandmate, I mean, gave it a little bit of attention as well. However, you know, we talk about, you know, the importance of, of, this, al of this album. And, and yes, it is important. However, I don't know if it was important enough that it needed you know, to be remixed. I mean, it's, it's nice to have all of these, these nice, you know, the takes and the demos. And I would have been happy if we just got, got that an anthology style uh, box set for just the Imagine sessions. Um, and then just, just leave the album alone because you know what, this is, this is the, the 2000, you know, release of Imagine and there's nothing wrong with this. It's, it's a beautifully mastered CD. Um, it's a lot better than the one that I think that came out in the eighties. Uh, and it works. I mean, this is, this is what I go to. Um, but however, probably with the success of Sgt. Pepper's last year, I mean, I mean, I think maybe that had something to do, even though this has been in the work from my understanding for about two years now. But, you know, I would imagine with the success of Sgt. Pepper, I mean, they probably gave them a lot of confidence with, hey, let's 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 do this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what the one thing, too, that I think is really cool is you really don't get the grasp or the feel for this album. I mean, until you understand, like when you see the movie, the Imagine movie, which we'll talk about, you know, in our in our, in our next episode. I mean, you you get a sense of where they were. You know, I mean, how much they were loved, their politics and and all of this. And you just you get all of this emotion and, and it just makes you respect the album a whole lot more and then you know the book and there's so much information that you that you know for me coming into this album later in life because i don't think i probably listened to this whole album until probably the late 90s mm -hmm. so all of this stuff i you know i missed all of this stuff so i didn't get to see you know them in action you know i didn't get to see them you know making their little films and you know and, and doing all their experimentations and stuff like that so this is really great for me to go back and really enjoy this album even more because of all that's being released with this album. Yeah, and and I so think I, I mean, and I agree. I really, uh, and I think that it's it's such a a, a gray well, and we'll we'll get to this in just just a second here. But uh, you know, this box sets a great opportunity to see. <clears throat> excuse me, what I thought was the case with this album. It is so well crafted mm -hmm. um it is mm -hmm. it's the opposite in in many ways in sound not so much in, in not entirely in theme but in sound to plastic ono band where that was bare bones here right. you get strings right. uh you know you get very elaborate um uh, arrangements production i mean you can hear <clears throat> excuse me in the um remastered version i mean you know you really hear all the different instruments involved i mean it is it is just a, a just so well crafted um and it was you know really a different sound for him in his solo career up up to that point i i think it um you know it was really a kind of a departure for him in sound it wasn't that kind of bare bones and certainly different from you know sometime in new york city something like that you know this is it is quote sugar-coated as, as john later um <laughs> described it 
it's sugar-coated, but in a, in a sophisticated way, I guess I would say. Like, it's not dumbing down his message. I mean, right. I, I don't think. It's it's making it even more sophisticated, mature. It's it's just, I've, I've loved this album from, probably I, I first um, heard it in the late 80s. Probably that's when I started getting into it. And I, I loved it from, from the moment um, I heard it. Um, and oh, and, and a viewer here, Matthew Smith, says some of John's best rock and roll solo moments too. Yeah, he has a great, some great vocals on this, some pure rock and roll. So before we get into the, the nitty gritty of this, um, Tom is going to show you uh, and describe for you what exactly is in this I mean, ultimate deluxe set. <laughs> it really is. So, Tom, why don't you take us through this? All right. Well, hopefully we won't have connection problems mm -hmm. while I do this. But, um, you know, here it is. This is this is your box. Um, it's the size of the Sgt. Pepper set from last year. Mm -hmm. So, go we'll next next to it but it's half the size so it go does go nicely against the the um paul mccartney archive sets but it, it you know it, it's not bad it's got the beautiful cover it's a strong it's not lightweight yeah. doesn't feel fun. Um, that said you know you come bring out first um first item um Oop, got some connection uh, connection issues there. Oh, the, the, the page of pages are, yeah. Uh, uh, I got some, uh, yeah, I can't hear you, Tom. Oh, okay, I think you're back. Uh, all right. Okay, it. you're back. Anyways. <laughs> okay, so anyways, the, the book is, is really well made. It's a hard cover. The pages are really nice. You know, um, I'm sure hopefully you guys, um, if you're interested and in, you're thinking about getting this, I, I definitely recommend, you know, spending the little bit extra to get the, the box set um, rather than just the, the two CD set. And that's one of the configurations of, of the set. I think there was the box set, then you had the two CD set, the second disc, uh, meaning bonus features, and then just a single CD. Um, and then the same for a vinyl as well, two vinyl set and a single vinyl set. So. Um, very well made book. Um, then, you know, on the back you got everything that you need to, uh, to um, track listings. You know, you got the two Blu-rays, you got the four CDs. Then you got your CDs, kind of like a uh, like a uh, Wings Over America kind of go um, um, spread here. Um, I don't know if you can see it. So you got the two Blu-rays. And on on the side you got the four. Obviously, I got one uh, in a in a CD player still, so <laughs> still listening. Um, you know, to be honest with you, I've never really cared for this kangaroo pouch style um, packaging. Thank but, you, uh, Tom. It seems to be the it's driving me nuts. <laughs> I have been trying to get these CDs, DVDs back in, and you have to really like you know <laughs> exactly like open. Right. And you're like, oh, I'm gonna rip it. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Right. <laughs> They I thought it was me. Uh, right, right, right. So I just feel like it, you got a greater chance to scratch, to scratch the scratch the product. Exactly. Um, you know, which doesn't necessarily make me happy. But um, but still, it's a well-made. I mean, it's still, it's not really flimsy. It's it's pretty, pretty strong. It's pretty sturdy. So um, again, you've got, mm. Once again, you got all the track listings on the back of this insert, and um, and it, it's really nice. Uh, I won't lie; I, I, I enjoy it a lot. So, um, and like I said, this 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 outer sleeve it's it's pretty sturdy. If you drop it, you know I don't think it's gonna, you know, unless you go in or something like that. You're not gonna. <laughs> No, that's Anyways, that's what but, me too. This is extremely well made. I mean, it's 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 right. not yeah, it's not flimsy. It's it's going to last a while. And I'm just going to show because right. we're going to get to this in a minute, Beetle Lad, or it says <laughs> why Blu-rays. We are actually going I'll to let you that know. Just, Tom, Tom is going to tell you all about that in just a minute. So hang right. on to that question. So I'm uh, so I'm sorry, Tom. Go right ahead. 
anyways, before I, you know, I talk about the Blu-rays, I just want to mention somebody, um, and that, that's a very lucky person. I'm very jealous of this of this gentleman, and, and that and that's Paul Hicks, and who he's been in the. Oh, well, we lost you again. Um, and okay. you. I think you're back. I think you're back. <laughs> okay. Yep, you're back. This is okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw my computer here in about ten seconds. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm gonna mention uh, Paul Hicks, who who like I said is has got to be one of the luckiest people on the planet right now. He gets to work on all of these on all these wonderful Beatle uh, and solo Beatle projects. Um, but first, I want to mention if if you know if you get in, um, his, uh, Yoko was very keen that these ultimate mixes should be archive um, three three things. Um, to be faithful and respectful to the originals, be general, generally sonical, sonically clear overall, and should increase the clarity of John's vocals. And it's all about John. Read that. The, one of the first yeah. um, realize about this set. Oh, man. <laughs> and you're, oh, and no. you're back. <laughs> All right. Oh, you got a lot uh, of technology. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, what I'm saying is, is if you don't read that, one of the things you should notice right right off the bat about this set is the vocals. Um, for mm -hmm. me, right off the bat, you know, the vocals were really outstanding. You know, there's there's some, you know, on the on the bonus tracks, you don't get some of that reverb, so you get that raw voice. You get his actual singing yeah. voice, and that's yeah. impressive. One of the things that I really Really loved about this set. So, anyways, where were we? Blu-rays. Now, why Blu-rays? Well, because you can get more information on a Blu-ray. You get more layers on a Blu-ray. Blu-rays tend to have a thinner um, laser, which is more like a violet blue. They call it's more violet, but they call it blue because violet ray doesn't sound as good as Blu-ray, you know. But, <laughs> but anyways, <clears throat> so less compression. Um, and you fit more more material on a Blu-ray, so that's why Blu-ray, and then that's why you can fit all the information plus more than you can on four CDs. So that's why that's why Blu-ray. Ah. Now let me let me ask a question because on the there's two yeah. discs of Blu-rays, and it's everything that's on the first four discs, correct? We're correct. correct. And then there's yeah, also more. there's supposed to be an interview with Elliot Mintz. In there, correct. You got, yeah, you got a, you got a half hour of Elliot Mitz uh, uh, interviewing John and Yoko, so you mm -hmm. get some of that. But and that's about a half hour long. Honestly, um, the first Blu-ray I think is right around uh, um, two hours, and that's going to cover you know pretty much the first two CDs. The second Blu-ray has about four hours on it, which is is really really impressive, and you probably could have even got more on it if they chose to. So, but once again, I don't know if you guys see it. Hopefully, you know the people that are watching, so you can, you know, you know what's already here. But a few things I don't know. Ken, Kit, you've you've heard the remix. I I would hope. Mm -hmm. I uh, the, the 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 album itself, just the album. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The remasters. Right. Yes. Um, you know what? Um, I what I found interesting and um, oh, before I get to that, we have a question here. Do you have to play those on the Blu-ray player only? I believe you do. Right. A Blu-ray a Blu player has to be played on a Blu-ray player. However, you can play DVD. Right. Yes. So hopefully okay. that. That's what yeah. I thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, so sorry about that. I just wanted to get to that question. Um, yeah. yeah right. I, you know, I, I think what's interesting is the, the remastering of the album to me wasn't as dramatic as say the Sgt. Pepper remaster was last year where that there were elements of that, that when you heard them, I mean, they just hit you. You know, I just thought, mm -hmm. wow. I mean, there were a couple of just wow moments. You know, I'd never noticed this particular sound. This remastering wasn't quite as as impactful to me in in that sense. I mean, it it didn't really reveal too many things, but and and I'm sure I'm going to get get flamed in the comments for saying this. <laughs> I'm not a big Phil Spector fan. I'm I'm going to just flat out 
say I, I'm not a huge fan. Um, and and one of my criticisms of, of him has been that, you know, you know, he created the wall of sound and, and all the echo to make it big. And I get that, you know, to get that big, big sound. But to me, it sacrificed some of the sound of, you know, the individual instruments. And it made kind of, for to me, kind of a muddy sound at times. This remaster does correct that for me. Mm -hmm. um, like, for instance, yeah. on How Do You Sleep, that hissing rattlesnake sound, I, I mean, that mm -hmm. really came through to me so much more than on the original recording. Um, the strings, you right. know, on, on Imagine and some of the other tracks were so much clearer. And there were a few moments where I did think, wow, you know, I, I'd never really was Klaus Vormann's bass. Boy, yeah. does it get a great treatment here. Um, and I think, you know, this remix really helped me in that sense to really appreciate again what what a well-crafted album this is and and it got rid of some of that that muddy sound for me now i don't know how you guys feel but but that's always been my issue with with phil specter and and this remaster does mm -hmm. a remastering does a nice job of, of correcting some of that yeah i definitely uh, agree with much of what you were saying there as an album when it first came out it was kind of muddy the first cd of imagine was kind of muddy yes. but all the versions that have come out since then have have vastly improved the album i really love the remastered one in 2010 and um you know all the different cds that came out in the 2000s that were remixed some of them were not remixed but i loved the sound on those and I would definitely say there's much more clarity all around. I know Yoko's biggest um, objective here, she's always big on John's voice. And she'll always mm. talk about that because we all know John didn't like his voice. He wanted to be covered up with reverb right. and stuff. And if Yoko had her way and she's getting that, <laughs> um, you know, everything would be just pure and raw because John has such a magnificent voice. But you hear such clarity in everything on uh, on this new remix. And, you know, I could say there's more punch in the drums. I could say that on, on many of the songs. You can hear the bass more in certain songs. Um, yep. Unfortunately, the very beginning of the song, Imagine, always had hiss. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's still there on this new remix. But there are certain songs that you hear with such, it's so clear, like the very beginning right. of All My Love in particular. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about bass kick, listen to the bass playing on I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. Yes. There's lines there that I didn't right. hear before. Yep. You know, and um, you know, it's it's a Jealous Guy has such a full sound. The the vocals on, on uh, Crippled Inside are so much clearer. Um, you know, there's a Christmas how, I gotta tell you, which is emerging as could be it's up there in my top three now of solo John Lennon songs. Wow. It's just a song that I just, I appreciate so much more now than I ever have before. Once you hear all the work that was put into it and what you hear on the remixed version of the album, it's just, it's, it's, it's a revelation. It's, um, you know, there's a, there's an ambiance that you hear on how that I hadn't heard before. Um, the punch that's there throughout. Oh, Yoko, uh, it's it's incredible this that first cd and by the way i mean you also have to mention the other songs that were recorded in 1971 around yeah. the time of yeah. imagine which are on that first disc and yes. power to the people oh, oh my god that sounds great yeah. doesn't it for, for those of you that haven't heard it at the very beginning of the song where you hear just the vocals of the chorus it sounds like there's so many more people singing. It's almost like it's surround sound you're when right. you're listening to that. It's it's incredible. It's the best sound I've ever heard of Power to the People. Um, and I also appreciate the fact that God Save Us, they released both commercial versions right. um, of mm -hmm. the Bill Elliott vocal with the Elastic Oz Band and the one that John sang lead to, as well as John's demo, which is included here too. Um, right. And Happy Christmas sounds great. Happy yes. Christmas is, sounds yeah. fantastic too. So um, I think a great job was done overall with the remix. Someone I saw complain that um, the strings sound awful on, on the remix. I didn't feel that way at all. Mm -hmm. right. In fact, that's one thing about this album that I've grown to appreciate through this box set is just how, 
how great the the orchestration is on many of the songs. Yeah. Mm, so. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with I agree with the, you know a lot of what you said. You know, uh, this that have been coming out these last couple years have been really wonderful for for bass and drums in my opinion and on a musician standpoint there's there, there's there's mvps you know throughout the you know solo career of the beatles and one of the per, one of the people that are all the way up to the top and it's it's klaus vorman like you guys both said mm -hmm. that, that you've we've been hearing on a lot of you know on the george stuff that's been coming out you know and this stuff i mean it's it's really mind blowing. I mean, if you don't, if you didn't know how good of a bass player Klaus was, it's right here on the, just alone on this, on this set. Especially, you know, on on the raw mixes that are here, the element mixes here, the raw studio mixes. A lot of this, you you know, you mentioned I don't want to be a soldier, Mama. Um, Ken, you got to listen to the the to the demos and the and the takes on here because of all of the songs. You know, I was hoping more of a, you know, um, evolution of, of songs here. But the only one that really take a, took on, a, on any kind of transformation was I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. Um, sure. Just the, you yeah. know, the tempo, the tempo of the song. And and I got drumming. I think it was Keltner that was on drums for this for this particular song. And, uh, I mean, it, it, it reminded me of um, uh, Why from Plastic to go on band. It, it's just really in your face, you know. You know, bass drumming and and really, you know, loud, you know, um, bass by uh, Klaus. So, um, really, really, wanting to talk about the stripped down stuff. <laughs> um, you know, there's a there's a version here where all of them, you know, are are stripped down, just kind of like the double fantasy was stripped down, and that uh, is really get the orc orchestration on imagine mm -hmm. you don't get the really cool curtis sax on on crippled inside and um but what you get is is john's vocals again and it's all kind of john's vocals which is really in my opinion the star uh, of you hear you know uh, the rawness of his voice which you never really got to hear before maybe you know you know the roughness of you know twist and shout you know but you really didn't get you know his the softness of like how or mm. oh my love and he's just really just you know you know just it's just really powerful and um i wish i could describe it better um no, the, but the it, subtleties, it's the really, subtleties in his voice yeah exactly the subtleties in his voice mm -hmm. are captured more when it's raw right. Yeah, that's that's true. Exactly. Yep. Let's uh, right. talk and a then, little. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, and the other really cool thing too is there's some. Um, it's called from the Masters multi track, and then this is like, imagine it's just the cripple inside. All you're hearing is the upright bass and the drums, and mm -hmm. and it's all throughout the whole. It's the whole album, and it's really cool how you're just getting you know bits and pieces of the song. And, uh, I thought that was really impressive as well. Absolutely. You're, oh, yeah. yeah oh, you're ahead, zeroing. Kid. You're zeroing in on individual musicians and what they contributed. Right. So exactly. that was really a nice touch what they did there. You know, and and I right. think too. I I think generally what what we're all getting at here is, I thought this is the the whole box set really is is a fascinating, sort of a a, a chronicle of not only how Imagine was made. But mm -hmm. kind of how an album is crafted. That's what mm -hmm. fascinated me as right. I was listening through. Like even the the, the disc. There's a disc called uh, I think it's called the Evolution Mixes, where it was right. you heard and, and right. they basically just pieced together different takes because they were all you know some of them broke down. They were all pretty small and and you you felt like you were a fly on the wall and you could hear the evolution of you know i don't want to be a soldier and and uh how do you sleep um you right. know and and hearing the chatter with uh john and george i love at one point george instructed yes. to do that i think it was uh he said do what you did on uh, i've got a feeling i think that's what i think that's right. what it was and i right. you just thought wow i mean it, it it just was it was like a fly on the wall but i think you know it, as i said you just you hear the progression this was such a painstakingly written and, and recorded process. I mean, you really understand after listening to the set why right. Imagine is is so great. And I just want to spend a, just a couple of minutes here talking about 
you know some of the outtakes uh that that were uh, you know that, that and that's that's my thing i have to admit and there were two <laughs> <laughs> there were two moments on here that i kid you not i was driving i was listening to this in my car and i swear to god i almost like pulled off the road to to listen to these right because i was just so blown away mm -hmm. which was it's so hard which mm -hmm. was take six mm -hmm. Why wasn't this on the album? I mean, the growling right. vocals um, and the, you know, it was it was such a like a harder, bluesier version. No strings. And I love the strings. Don't get me wrong. Right. But and, on right. other cuts. But this I thought, wow, maybe they could have left the, the strings off. Guitar solo right yeah. from like the blues. Oh, my gosh. I, I just I, I truly I think I even said, you know, wow, like out loud. And I was by myself. Um, and uh, and the other one was Jealous Guy, um, take nine. It was just his voice, unadorned, no right. no studio enhancements, and he sounded like he was you know right up to the mic. And yeah. you just heard a, a couple of people are saying here. Here's one saying, "Always been my favorite singer." This take was a perfect example of that. You heard the pain in his voice. Uh, you know, you heard the the you know shame of being a jealous guy. I mean, it, it just it it struck me so deeply hearing that version without the echo and and the effects. Just him. And uh, those were two right. of my favorite moments. So how how about you guys? Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to bounce off what you said about it so hard, because when I heard that particular take kit, my immediate thought was, this could have fit on Plastic on All Band. Yeah, you're right. you're it right. It really had that vibe to it. But that's one of the special things about listening to this box set. Even if you hear the release take of one of the songs on Imagine with something missing whether it's strings or whether it's a guitar solo. There's a take of Give Me Some Truth without George's guitar solo. And you hear the other guitar parts, the arpeggios that are played, and it has a whole different feel to it. And it, it just goes to show you how each part played, a, uh, you know, uh, you know, was a big contribution to the song. But even when you remove it, it has a different vibe, which is, is good to itself. Um, you mentioned it so hard. Um, I love the the beginning of disc two. They have just elements of the songs, which is where you'll hear a lot of the orchestration. Right. And as I just said about how, which I love that song to death, <laughs> you just hear the strings. You just hear the orchestration on how. And I tell you something, yeah. it's so gorgeous. It could exist as a piece of music just like that without anything else. It's yeah. that good. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it makes you appreciate the work that was put into that. Um, Crippled Inside, take three. It's a completely different take. And it has uh, different playing from George on the dobro, the slide part. Mm -hmm. um, Nikki, Nikki Hawkins' solo is really nice in that. Um, there's another take of Crippled Inside with a different guitar solo. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many things here. I love every single take of How Do You Sleep. Mm -hmm. It's all fascinating to me. It's not just the song, but one thing I'll, I will right. disagree with with what you said, Tom, is that you know John is the star here with his voice. If anything, listening to all these different takes, you realize what a great band this was. I would have killed to yeah. have seen this band go out on the road. Um, Nicky Hopkins shines so much throughout this album. I knew it all along with what he contributed to Jealous Guy. I love the piano part on Jealous Guy. But when you hear it isolated and you hear other things that he did on other takes with the piano part, it's just so perfect. It doesn't get in the way of, in the way of anything. It just complements the song so well. And likewise, on How Do You Sleep, yes, I love John's voice. It's so gritty. I love George's slide guitar work. But listen to what Nicky Hopkins is doing on the keyboards there. Yeah. How, how he ends yeah. the song and improvises on each take I could listen to that over and over. He just adds so much. He, mm -hmm. he has the right touch. And that's like the sign of a great studio musician. And he did great work with, with uh, George Harrison in particular, too, on Living in the Material yeah. World mm -hmm. on that album. But what he does to the songs here on the Imagine album are just, it's tremendous. It's just right. right. 
what whatever whatever he brings. I agree. So, I, I never fully appreciated Nicky Hopkins until this, you know, yeah, and now right. now I have great appreciation of his of his talent. That's for that's a very good right. point, Ken. Right, and also right. Uh, we mentioned. You know, okay. I just wanted to bring up Power to the People because we we talked about um, the release take and how it was so different with the introduction there is a completely different take of power to the people on the second disc mm -hmm. and it starts off mm -hmm. with an introduction without vocals right you know with the yes. sax in there and that yeah. was pretty cool that was <laughs> radically different in that way you know mm -hmm. uh but it, it could have went out like that it was good enough to come out that yeah. way originally in 1971 so those are just right. some of the highlights for me and i'm only talking about this too <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom. Right. What, what were a couple of highlights for you? Almost everything. You know, I'm fascinated by the relationship of John and Paul. You know, in that you know, in that you know, three four year span. You know, so obviously, you know, how do you sleep was something that you know I wanted to really you know examine and check out, read about. There's some really cool you know text in the book about it. If you don't mind, if I can read something real quick, and it was just sure. this is John talking, and he's just like. Paul personally doesn't feel as though I insulted him or anything because I had dinner with him last week. He's quite happy. If I can have a, if I can't have a fight with my best friend, who can I have a fight with? You know, so, I mean, it's just, you know, stuff like that. And then, you know, I love the, the, the uh, extending of the books on certain words. How do you sleep? Like, so Sergeant Pepper took you by surprise. So he extended the, the vocals on, you know, at, at the end of mm. Surprised, and then all of his vocals the, went up throughout the, the song. I really cool, mm -hmm. and the um, you know, the rattlesnake, you know, sound effects, you know, <laughs> it's just you know, really cool. And then, you know, and then not only does you know Klaus Foreman as well, but you know, uh, George Harrison's works, you know, throughout all these takes really shine as well. So yeah, in a way, you are right. I mean, the band is is also very heavily featured, and it started oh. so. So, you know, so it was more, you know, the first thing I gravitated towards was the, you know, the how do you sleep. And then next, was, oh, my love, which is probably one of my all time favorite, you know, John Lennon ballads uh, next to Out out the Blue. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I just George Harrison's work, you know, guitar work on that is 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 second to none. And, you know, I think even John admitted that this was some of his John or George's best guitar thing. I think it was this song or or one of, or how do you you sleep or one, you know some of the solos on yeah yeah, yeah. a lot of people yeah, play 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 play. throughout yeah right but if i can just say this but it's just one thing uh, oh you're out again Tom. all right Damn okay. okay i How think you're now? coming back i think you're back all right Okay, but anyways, um, if there was one thing I could have on the set that wasn't here, and then you know we said the power of the power to the people is here, and I know this is a John Lennon album, but Yoko, is, her stamp is all over this album, so I would have loved to have seen the original B side to Power to the People, um, the Yoko song "Open Your Box," which if you haven't heard, go to YouTube. It's a really good song, and um, I haven't seen it yet on any of her. Um, recently uh, released remaster CD. So I don't know if she has plans to release that song again soon, but um, it would have been nice to have seen this on the set. So, yeah, okay. but a lot of great stuff. The, the, ele the um, elevation or evolution documentary um, set that's on um, the uh, Blu-ray disc two, and then you get some of it on the uh, CD four. That's really cool where they just bit, you know, yes. pieces. And then on the Imagine where right off the bat, he's talking about where the, the inspiration for the, the lyrics came from, from the, you know, Yoko's Grapefruit um, book and how he just wasn't man enough to give Yoko the credit for that song, you know, I thought was was very brave of him to say, come out and say, you know, because, yeah, I mean, he's he, at times he was a very selfish person and, you know, he wanted that time to shine. So, you know, I mean, at that point, I can understand it. But, you know, now Yoko's name is on on that song and, and all is right in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Well, I can't believe we're, we're almost out of time. So what we might do is maybe we'll continue a bit of this discussion in the next episode when we're talking about uh, the book and uh, the DVD, uh, because we didn't get to a lot of things we wanted to talk about because Oh, is this a this is a dense, uh, you know, set? But it's a wonderful set 
Um, I, I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say it's well worth it. Uh, you will learn yes. a lot. You know, as I said, it's 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 just like a peek at what it's like to craft an album. It's fascinating. You know, it's mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating. Yeah. First class packaging. I'm I'm not being paid for saying any of this. It's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I just realized I sound like a commercial. I'm I'm not. Yeah. It, it it is really a high quality set. So I think we'll we'll continue this a, a little bit maybe in the next episode because there's so much we we still uh, did we need to get to so uh so before yes and we will talk about the book which uh tom is is giving you a little preview of right there i'm i've ordered my copy and uh so hopefully uh, I'm, well i'm sure it'll be there by the next time so oh, yeah. uh so before we sign off uh why don't we uh tell everybody where we can be reached uh what uh what's you're working on anything we should know so uh so tom how about we start with you Okay, thank you, Kits. Well, um, David and I, we just finished our crossover podcast event with the fellows over at the uh, When They Was Fab podcast, Ed Chen and Lonnie Pena. We did a um, commentary on the Rock Show film. So we did the uh, first half uh, on their side, and then we just finished and posted the second half on our side yesterday. Um, so that's up on, our, on Podbean. If you go to Podbean, um, type in two legs with the, with the number two, uh, you'll see our logo. Click on that. Aaron, you can, um, um, I'll post it on our, you know, on our Facebook page as well. Uh, you can email us at two legs podcast. Um, yeah. G at, uh, gmail dot, or gmail dot com. Um, we're on the Twitter, Facebook page, um, two legs, a Paul McCartney podcast. We've got more interviews coming up. We mentioned Jerry Hammock earlier, whose uh, recording reference manual is, is excellent. I'm looking forward to seeing Jerry again. And then, you know, Alan Cozen and an interview that we've got coming up that's I'm really excited about. Um, and I'll just say that it has something to do with, with McCartney's, you know, 45 covers and that's that'll be about it so Interesting. <laughs> yes. oh, right. curious great well yes. i'm curious yeah, absolutely oh my gosh ken you always have a lot of stuff going on so uh tell us what you're doing uh well first of all if you want to reach me by email um my address is every little thing at att.net um, my other podcast show, Things We Said Today, we're recording a show tomorrow. We'll be talking about the Imagine box set, <laughs> just like we did. What a shock. But it's, <laughs> but it, you know something, you know, when, when all these new releases come out, it's great that all these different podcasts cover it because everybody has their own take on it. You get different opinions from different people. And I find that all worthwhile. So, uh, you know, Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen shared the, the program with me. We'll be talking about that and talking about Jeff Emmerich, and I'll get, you know, their takes as well. And that should be posted the end of this week, probably by Friday. Um, also on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, I always have Beatles trivia every single week. And on my Beatles trivia page, I have a John Lennon trivia question for his birthday, and I have a choice of one of nine prizes that you can win every single week, like Kit's book, Songs You Were Singing. And, really? Uh, yes, it's on there. <laughs> oh, I'm shocked. It hasn't left that page for two years. <laughs> <laughs> and you know people keep writing in because they still they keep wanting to win it but um just recently i added paul's album egypt station as a prize and just added this week is the new two disc version of john lennon's imagine album so it's the remixed album and then the second disc of what's in the box set so you can win that i also want to mention that uh last week i had the pleasure of interviewing two guys who i think tom you interviewed on two legs and that's alex kane and terry mccusker oh, yeah. um did you interview them tom i think you had no, them on two no. legs oh okay no, no, well no. anyway yeah a couple of years ago they released a book called ringo star and the beatles beat those two guys mm -hmm. are both drummers and they're both from liverpool so we automatically like them. And, um, yes. <laughs> you know, this, is a, this is a very intense study of Ringo's contributions as a drummer to the Beatles. They highlight certain sections of Beatles songs where Ringo does something unique to the song and where it enhances the Beatles songs. And it's really a, you know, a very thorough study in such a way that the average person could also understand it. There's notation there for, for those certain passages in Beatles songs. So if you want to learn about that, 
and what made Ringo so different as a drummer. Um, I just did an interview with those two guys, and they're on my website. They're on my interviews page four page, and it's about an hour <laughs> long. So if you want to uh, learn more about Ringo as a drummer, you can go there as well. And one more thing that I wanted to add, um, for those of you who are curious about my show, Every Little Thing, which is really the bulk of my work in radio, I've been doing the show for it's it's 36 and a half years now and wow. about 70% of the shows that I've done are that show. But the syndicated show which is 1 hour long, if you ever wanted to hear it, um there's one very easy way that you can. There's a website based out of Germany called globaltexanchronicles.com and if you click on the Ken Michaels tab, there's a lot of my archive shows there so you can get a feel for what that show is all about. It's Beatle music, solo music, as you said, Kit, interesting themes, interviews. It's basically, if you're familiar with the book All Together Now and the works of Wally Pedrasic and Harry Castleman, anything the Beatles ever touched can ever be can, can be in this show. Uh, that means songs they produced for other people, songs they wrote for other people, cover versions of Beatles songs, family members, Apple recording artists. It all gets thrown into one show, and that's why it's called Every Little Thing. So there's no telling what you're going to hear at every single show. And if you want to hear any of those archived shows, just go to that website, globaltexanchronicles.com. And I think that covers everything. All right. <laughs> excellent. Can I, can I add something real quick? Oh, sure. I, add yeah. something, uh, I, just, I just want to say everybody out there if you're if you really if you want a bookshelf full of books listen to ken michael's interviews because he's got a lot of authors on there and i gotta tell you that my my bookshelf is is full to the brim thanks for those interviews because oh, thank you they're 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 great and it you know ken does a great job with the interviews and it makes me and it makes me want to go out and and get those books and you know i think um everybody that listens will have that same feeling so i agree well, thank you, Tom. I, well, I appreciate that. Well appreciate said. That. Yeah. Well said. All right. Well, I am, uh, let me think. Okay, I've got two articles up since we last uh, were on. Uh, one is a review of uh, Ringo Starr and the All-Star Band concert from September, uh, the, their Chicago stop. The other, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my salute to Jeff Emmerich. Those are both at somethingelsereviews.com. Uh, you can also find them on my website, which you are just looking at right now, kiddotool.com. Uh, I also also, we'll have my next, I mentioned that I host a show called Bottomless Soul. My next episode will be up Monday, October 16th um, at, on Bumps Radio England, and that'll be at 11 p.m. Eastern Time. It's going to be part two of the show I did last time, which is underappreciated uh, women in R&B from the 60s and 70s. I've had a lot of fun doing this. It's This is one of my, besides the Beatles, soul and R&B is my passion, and I've, I've just been having a blast doing this show. So, uh, so that will be on. Uh, and then I'm going to be doing my own Facebook Live show. Uh, my usual monthly thing is, well, the as John once said, the usual rubbish. It's uh, October 18th um, at uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. That'll be on my personal Facebook page. I'll just be giving Giving you updates and by then I will have Deep Beatles and Deep Soul up. I'm sorry I've been delayed with those. It has been and I think my my uh, my colleagues will agree with all the stuff that's been going on. It's been crazy. So I've uh, so I'm a little oh, behind in the her. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, and so I they will uh, be back, I assure you. Um, also just wanted to mention because we forgot to mention it last time. You can reach us uh, here at Talk More Talk. Uh, you can email us, uh, which I'm typing right now, talkmoresolotalk <laughs> at gmail.com. Okay, let me show that for you. Okay, so that's our that's our um, email. We love getting feedback, questions. Please, uh, please f uh, send us your thoughts. Uh, of course, join our official Facebook page, which is Talk More Talk Videocast. You can look us up on Facebook, and you're on it right now if you're watching it, so you know where it is. And like us to receive notifications of future episodes. And you can follow us on Twitter at Talk More Talk One, uh, where you'll also get the latest. Uh, updates on our future shows so well guys this has been a pleasure i mean we could just go on for another hour <laughs> at least <laughs> uh, i 
Yeah. Yep, and, yes. and and I, as I said, I you know at the beginning of the show, I'm I'm so lucky to be co-hosting the show with you guys. Not only great experts, but great friends. So um, you know, just a just a, a real you know, this has just been a real treat every time. Um, uh, and- let's, let's also remember that, that hopefully Ken Womack will be back with us on our next show, and he yes. can give us his take on everything in this box set as well. Exactly. So, yeah, I think the next episode will have to be part two because we we uh, of this and as we mentioned, the book and the DVD, we will talk about right. all of that next time. Thank you all for staying up late and watching us and for this very, uh, very special extended show. Um, and uh, we will see you next time. So from all of us, as Ringo would say, good night. <laughs>